This is Sally. She's an artist with a dream and a brush in hand. After years of selling her paintings at local markets, she finally took the leap and launched her very first online store, sallyshop.test. Every corner of the site is her own creation, from the homepage layout to the hand-picked fonts. It's a digital reflection of her art, built with care. To protect her customers and their login data, Sally added what she believed was a strong security feature, a CAPTCHA. Now bots and hackers can't just brute force username or passwords, she thought. They'd need to be human to get past the CAPTCHA. But what Sally doesn't know is that even the strongest looking locks can be opened if they're built wrong. And this is where Kim comes in. He is an ethical hacker, a penetration tester hired to find security flaws before the real criminals do. Today, Kim will probe the login form on Sally Shop. And he's about to prove that this CAPTCHA is far from unbreakable. Let's dive in. In the last episode, we watched as Kim prepared his attack on Sally's login system. We saw that he used four main Python libraries. Requests to communicate with Sally's server, just like a browser would. PyTesseract to automatically read CAPTCHA images, turning visuals into real text. Pillow to load and manipulate the image. And Bytes.io acted as a translator, converting raw image data into something Python could work with. After that, Kim defined the three key URLs he'd be working with. The base of the site, the login URL where login forms are submitted, and the CAPTCHA URL which returns a fresh CAPTCHA image. Then Kim started a persistent session. This is critical because without it, every request would be treated as coming from a new user. By maintaining the same session, Kim ensures the server sees him as the same person each time, using the same session ID across requests. Finally, Kim defined the heart of his automation, a function called getNewCAPTCHA. Every time this function is called, it visits the login page to trigger a new CAPTCHA, downloads the CAPTCHA image, solves it using optical character recognition with Tesseract, and returns both the image for debugging and the solved CAPTCHA text. Now that Kim can automatically solve CAPTCHAs, Sally's login page is no longer protected. The final ingredient, a list of usernames and passwords to test alongside the CAPTCHA. And for that, Kim turns to a powerful open source resource called SecLists. SecLists is a massive collection of the most common usernames, passwords, payloads for brute forcing, and security testing. It's like a dictionary, but for hackers. It is used by professionals in bug bounty hunting, penetration testing, and ethical hacking. To see if it's already installed, Kim opens a terminal and types seclists. The system returns a command not found message and offers to install it. Kim types yes to confirm, and just like that, the entire seclist package is downloaded to his machine. Now that it's installed, if Kim runs seclists again, a list of folders appear. These are the different categories in the collection. Two stand out right away, usernames and password. That's exactly what Kim needs. With those two lists and his CAPTCHA solver, Kim now has everything required to brute force Sally's login form, one attempt at a time. For usernames, Kim chose the top usernames shortlist. This list is small, focused, and fast, perfect for testing login pages quickly. Let's see what it contains using the cat command. And as you can see, it includes some of the most common usernames used across the internet, things like root, admin, administrator, exactly the kind of credentials attackers try first. Kim copies the full file path and pastes it into his notebook. Then he writes two simple lines of code to load the usernames. Let's break that down. The first line opens the file for reading. R means read mode. Encoding UTF-8 ensures it can handle standard text. Setting errors to ignore tells Python to skip over any weird or unreadable characters. The with statement is a clean and safe way to open files. It automatically closes the file afterward. The first part of the second line reads the entire file into memory, and then split lines splits it into a list, one username per line. Just to verify, Kim prints the first five usernames. And there they are, ready to use in the brute force loop. He can also print the first 10 usernames in his notebook and compares them to the terminal output from earlier as you can see, they match exactly. 
that confirms the username list was loaded correctly. Kim now has the username word list inside his notebook, ready to be used in his attack. Next, Kim does the same for the password list. He heads back to the terminal and navigates to the passwords folder inside Seclists. When he scrolls up, he sees several interesting folders, including leaked databases, default credentials, or common credentials. These folders are gold mines for security testing. Leaked databases contains real credentials dumped from past data breaches. Default credentials includes factory default logins used by routers, IoT devices, and software. And common credentials? That's a curated list of passwords used by millions of people, the weak, the predictable, and the reused. That's exactly what Kim is looking for. Kim heads into it and finds several pre-built lists based on leaked and popular credentials. Among them, he spots one called Best15, a small but powerful list of the most commonly used passwords in the world. To see what it contains, he used the cat command, and the results speak for themselves. Passwords like dragon, let me in, or I love you. These aren't just guesses. These are real passwords used by millions of people every day. If someone used one of these credentials on Sally's site, Kim will find it. Kim copies the full path and pastes it into his notebook. Just like before, he writes a with open block to safely reads the file and use split lines to turns it into a list of individual passwords. To confirm, Kim prints the whole list and compares it with what he saw in the terminal, a perfect match. Now Kim has both usernames and passwords ready in memory and a working CAPTCHA solver. The pieces are all in place. Now that Kim has a CAPTCHA solver, a list of usernames, and a list of passwords, he's ready to launch the attack. The function he writes for this is called brute force CAPTCHA, and this is where everything happens. Let's go through it line by line. This function takes two arguments, a list of usernames and a list of passwords, and it will try every combination of both. It uses two nested loops, one for each username and one for each password. For every pair, it attempts to log in. Now here's the trick. Some CAPTCHAs might fail to be read correctly by Pytesseract, the optical character recognition engine. This also happens to humans. Sometimes the text is simply unclear. So Kim wraps the login logic in a while true loop. This while loop means keep trying the same username and password combo until a CAPTCHA is solved successfully. We this, Kim ensures that no username password combo is skipped due to a CAPTCHA recognition failure. The attack is divided into four main steps. The first step is to solve the CAPTCHA. For this, Kim calls the function from earlier to request a new CAPTCHA and solve it using Tesseract. He keeps only the solved text, not the image. Remember that this function refreshes the browser, retrieves the CAPTCHA image, and solves it. In the second step, he prepares the login form data, just like a real user would submit it. This login data is composed of the current username, password, and CAPTCHA. The third step is crucial. This is where Kim attempts the actual login. Using the persistent session he created earlier, he sends a post request to the login endpoint with the form data. This request mimics what a browser would do, but fully automated. The server checks if the CAPTCHA is correct for that session, and if the username and password match a valid account. In the final step, Kim inspects the server's response to decide what to do next. When he visits Sally's login page in the browser and enters a wrong CAPTCHA, the server replies, CAPTCHA failed, please try again. But if he enters the wrong username or password, but the correct CAPTCHA, the message changes to invalid username or password. And that is a huge clue. This tells Kim something very important about how the server processes the login request. It means the server checks the CAPTCHA first. Only after the CAPTCHA is validated, it move on to verifying the username and password. And that's not unusual. In fact, it's exactly how most web applications work. By showing two different error messages, Sally's server is accidentally leaking information. It's telling Kim exactly which part failed, the CAPTCHA or the credentials. And that's all Kim needs. 
In his script, he can build a similar logic to simply inspects the response text returned by the server and reacts accordingly. If the response contains the message, CAPTCHA failed, Kim knows that the CAPTCHA was not solved correctly. In that case, he uses Python's continue statement. The role of the continue statement is to skip the rest of the current loop iteration and jump back to the beginning of the while loop. That means the function get new captcha is called again. This means the login page is refreshed, a new captcha is generated, and Kim tries the same username and password again with a new captcha. Now, if the response contains invalid username or password, Kim knows that the captcha was correct, but the username or password were wrong. So there's no point retrying this combination. He uses the break statement to exit the while loop, which is the CAPTCHA solving loop, and moves on to the next password. That means the username is the same, but the password is new, which result in a new username password combination. And finally, if neither error message appears in the response, that means the CAPTCHA was solved successfully and the username and password are valid. Kim has found a working credential pair. At that point, the script prints the result and the attack is complete. The brute force captcha function then returns the successful username and password, stopping the attack entirely. The login message line creates a human readable log message that shows exactly what the brute force captcha function is trying at each step. It includes the current username, the current password, and the CAPTCHA value that was just solved. Kim uses this message to print detailed feedback during the attack. While the brute force loop is running, this log message is printed when a CAPTCHA fails, when credentials are incorrect, and when a login attempt succeeds. This makes it easy to follow the progress in real time, debug issues if something goes wrong, and clearly see which combination worked. Let's run this brute force CAPTCHA function. Actually, before doing that, let's add a visual touch. Instead of just printing the solved CAPTCHA text, why not display the actual CAPTCHA image for each attempt? It makes the attack easier to follow and a lot more fun to watch. Kim scrolls up to the line where the get new CAPTCHA function is called. The underscore here means we don't care about the image, just the text. But now Kim wants to display the image too so he changes it and makes sure the function returns both values. And then he can display the image. But in Jupyter Notebooks, images only show up if they're the last line of the cell. But that's not the case here, so Kim uses a better approach, the display function from IPython. He scrolls back up to his import cell and adds the import for the display function, then runs the cell to make sure it's available everywhere in the notebook. He can now scrolls back down to the brute force captcha function and adds a line to display both the captcha image and the solved captcha text right after the captcha is solved. This will display the actual captcha image and the text that Tesseract extracted from it. Now everything is ready. So for every login attempt, the captcha image is displayed. This shows exactly what the OCR engine, here Tesseract, is trying to solve. If Tesseract fails to solve the captcha, the message CAPTCHA failed appears. And when the CAPTCHA is solved correctly, but the username or password is wrong, a wrong credentials message is shown. In the next cell, Kim simply calls the brute force CAPTCHA function. He passes it the lists of usernames and passwords he read from seclists. Now he can run the cell and the attack begins. CAPTCHA after CAPTCHA appears. Each one is read, solved, and submitted automatically. Usernames and passwords are tested one by one. Let's take a closer look at the output. On the first login attempt, the CAPTCHA is solved correctly. You can see it. 2144 is extracted and submitted. But the credentials are wrong, so the script moves on to the next password, 1234. This time, the CAPTCHA isn't read correctly. Tesseract returns 995, resulting in a CAPTCHA failed message. The script therefore keeps retrying the same username and password until a CAPTCHA is solved properly. On the third attempt, it gets a valid CAPTCHA. But the credentials are still wrong, so the script continues. This process repeats over username and password combinations. You can see that sometimes the CAPTCHA fails. 
and sometimes it's solved and the script moves on to the next password. When the password list is exhausted, it moves on to the next username and repeats the process. Until, finally, bingo. For the username admin and password dragon, there's no error, jackpot. Kim has broken in, not with some magic exploit, but with patience, logic, and automation. Sally's site is now compromised. With these credentials in hand, Kim can log in. He heads to Sally's login page and enters the credentials he just discovered. Admin as the username and dragon as the password. Then he solves the captcha displayed on the page just like any human would. And clicks login. And voila, he's in. Logged in as admin and with full access to the site. All it took was automating the captcha reading and a server that gave just a little too much away. If you found this video helpful or eye-opening, give it a like and subscribe for more deep dives into real-world cybersecurity flaws explained step by step. Thanks for watching and see you in the next episode. Until then, stay curious and stay secure. Bye-bye.